Hi everyone, this is Yuri Rebitz and Timothy William from Global Composers Network, joined today by a very special guest, Michael John Mollo from Velvet Green Music. Uh, the to topic of today's roundtable is working with music libraries, uh, and that's why we invited Michael, uh, so we can learn a little bit about what music libraries are, um, how they work, and hopefully help you as composers to work better and achieve better results when working with these music libraries, as well as give you some tips for any other projects uh, you might work on. All right, cool. Yeah, to get started, uh, we just want you, Mike, to um, go ahead and introduce yourself and Velvet Green. Um, talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and just give our viewers a brief overview of kind of what production music is. Sure. Uh, okay. So my name is Michael John Mallow. I uh, am a composer. Uh, I do a little bit of music supervision, but I'm the creative director at Velvet Green Music in San Monica, California. We're a production music catalog as well as bespoke uh, music house for film, TV, advertising, games, uh, that sort of thing. Basically anything that needs music for its content, we try and provide that. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I uh, was a guitar player, toured around as a sort of as a youth uh, and then did about seven years of music college, um, ended up here in Los Angeles to go to USC, which has a fantastic program. I highly recommend their scoring program for anybody interested in pursuing uh, this career. It's incredibly expensive, but incredibly worthwhile, and nothing beats a 60-piece uh, orchestra at Warner Brothers. So uh, go, go Trojans. Um, so I came out here about... Uh, maybe 12 or 13 years ago uh, to do that and then stayed uh, you know after school kind of floated around for a little while as a computer tech uh, doing uh, tech work assistant work for a lot of composers I worked for Chris Leonard's Aaron Zygman uh, Michael Giacchino a little bit Giorgio Moroder and uh, and I ended up landing with John Powell uh, for about five years or so, give or take. Um, and John was fantastic, taught me basically everything I know about programming, uh, you know, how to expand a musical language, how to work with filmmakers, that sort of thing. Um, after I left John, I found myself writing for uh, a number of libraries uh, and production music catalogs kind of all over town. I think at, at one point I was you know, just firing off tracks to about six or seven different libraries at a time. Um, so it, it's good to, to, to diversify because not every library does the exact same thing, you know. All right, so, you know, some some libraries do one thing versus another, so it's good to diversify. So I found myself writing for a bunch of different catalogs, um, you know, trailer music for some, uh, orchestral music for others. Um, and then, you know, between doing my other, you know, scoring gigs, I've got a couple of TV projects and indie films and games here and there. Um, I sort of stumbled into starting my own catalog, you know, I actually never set out to really run uh, a company, but, uh, you know, fast forward to 2017, we started a catalog with 25 albums and with 40 uh, composers. Eight, here we are 18 months later, we just put out album number 101, and we've got just under 400 uh, folks writing for us right now. Yeah, so uh, we were thinking, like like you said, maybe start with, um, like you said, not all music libraries are the same. Uh, so what would you suggest for composers? Because many of them try to diversify a lot, and then you have other composers that are very specific. Um, I, sure. I've, I've, I've done a lot of research on this, and there's many music libraries that claim it's good to be specific, but not too specific. So it's good to find out what you're good at and then stick with that. What's, what's your opinion on that? Well, you know, we as composers, uh, for, specifically for, for film and TV and for libraries and stuff, we don't have the luxury of just being able to write whatever we want whenever the hell we want. Right, you know what we what we have to realize is that uh, we are we're generating a product, right? So I, I think I mean the conversation is not specifically geared towards libraries. Do I write one thing or do I write everything? It's more of a philosophy about who you are as an artist, right? So uh, a composer should think of themselves one as a business owner, but also second as a brand, right? When somebody uh, whether it's a library or whether it's a another composer or a um, uh, filmmaker, for instance, l researches you and finds you probably on the internet because that's how everybody finds each other these days. They're going to not only listen to your music, but they they listen with their eyes as well as their ears. Mm. So you know what does your personal brand sound like? Um, I'm a big proponent of that. That said, 
you know, if your thing is dramatic, dark tension, a la Reznor and Ross, or, you know, a la C Cliff Martinez or something, you still should be able to pull off romantic comedy. Um, cause you never know what gig is going to fall into your lap. So, you know, like I don't put that out there on my website, but I can write circles in romantic comedy, you know, like right. <laughs> I've got a couple of different shows that I actually do that for, but that's not necessarily part of my brand as a composer. So that's not the first thing you see on my webpage. Right. Like you can dig a little deeper and find it, but to the point you should definitely play to your strengths. And you should be writing the music that you want to write. If you hate polka, you shouldn't be writing for a polka right, library. Right. Well, um, so play to your strengths, but also, you know, you need to be able to essentially do whatever is called upon you to do. If somebody comes to me and says, you know, we're doing a tango record, I don't, but I can write some material and get an accordion player in here this afternoon if I need to. Right. Um, but that's not necessarily part of who I am as an artist. But if that's the gig that comes, I'm not going to turn it down. I mean, unless it's a crappy gig. But uh, you know, you know what I'm saying. You got to be able to adapt to whatever situation. But you yeah. still should have a specific brand. And think of the most successful composers. They normally do. Look at an Elfman. Look at uh, Trent Reznor. Look at John Williams, Hans Zimmer. You know, they have very specific brands. However, they can do essentially anything. You know, mm -hmm. you think of Alan Silvestri. You think of Back to the Future. But you know what? Look, listen to the score for Ready Player One, and that is completely different. Right. Amazing, you know. But you need to be able to kind of do it all. So the answer to the question is yes. Yes, you should have a brand. Yes, you should do one specific thing, and yes, you should be able to do everything. <laughs> uh, we were thinking, like opening up this discussion a little bit, because there's, uh, like um, Tim said, there's many people that have question. You know, how do I get started? But there's also a lot of people that are already uh, at the point where they can write music, they write good music, um, but they are not really sure, they're not ready maybe for the uh, admin work or right. they're not, they don't know how that kind of um, uh, collaboration, just correspondence with the music library happens. And sure. just, you know, what does it take you know, what do they need to know in terms of, you know, stemming, um, just knowing technical aspects, um, being a good organized person, how to be consistent, all of these things. Um, because I noticed with myself, like until I started writing for you, uh, I wasn't aware of how much of that, like, you know, how much weight that holds. Uh, so maybe we talk about that a little bit um, to help, you know, any composers sure. get familiar no, no, a little bit. The biggest thing, man, is uh, is organization and just if somebody sends you uh, a brief or some instructions or, you know, some delivery requirements or if somebody is taking the time to, to give you the information that you need, it's just real important to read it. Mm. Right. You do get a lot of folks that after we send the brief um, or after we send delivery requirements, they send us something back and clearly they didn't read right. <laughs> you know what it is that we that we need um so I, I think that's that's the first thing is just be organized and you know um it's great to ask questions uh, you know i'm i'm a big proponent of folks uh asking a lot of questions for me because i'm happy to share information with someone um if it's going to make their lives and essentially my life easier down mm -hmm. the road you know, like I am an abundance, I'm a wealth of information, um, which we'll, I will gladly give to our artists so that A, that they can succeed. B, we don't have to have six emails back and forth to figure out exactly, you know, right. what it is that they, they need to get from us and we need to get from them. Um, so follow instructions. Is, and really just just be organized about your session you know if somebody's asking for asking you to do a final mix and a master you know you should be prepared to do that we like to do all of ours here in house at velvet green music um because it makes it easier one for us to kind of craft alternate mixes um because a lot of clients will ask for um you know if it's a big hybrid orchestral cue we'll release the full mix version, but we also might release a version that is just the orchestra or right. without, without any orchestra, it'll just be like synth and perks and Perk pulses. Only, and that, right, right. Yeah, as, as an alternate mix. And it's so much easier for us to just be able to do that 
go through the stems, mute a couple of them, and create that mix rather than have six emails back and forth with an artist mm. just be like, okay, let's do, let's get that again, but this time pull out the big whoosh at two minutes and seven seconds, you know, like that mm. that kind of communi communication communication needs. So we uh, ask everybody to send us all the stems. We do a final mix, uh, you know, somewhat mix and, and a master on everything. And then when the clients come back and they're like, oh man, we really love this sort of, uh, you know, Tom Newman American Beauty track. We wish it didn't have guitar in it. Right. Then we can just call up the session and shoot them, you know, within three minutes, shoot them a, a, a version of that with just the mm -hmm. guitar muted and it automatically meets. Um, so, so every library is different. I know a lot of catalogs prefer the artists to do the alternate mixes, right. prefer the artists do the 30, 60, 90 cut downs. We take care of that just because it limits, you know, with 400 artists, it's easier for us to just collect all the material, right. do it ourselves. You know, once, once an artist sends us their final splits, they're essentially done. Mm. You know, that, that's it. They can, they can sort of put their feet up and we'll take it from there. We do all the mixing, the masking, the tagging. Metadata is huge. That is a whole other like conversation about, you know, yeah. what you put up out into the universe and I can't tell you how many times I get an email with an attachment where the piece of music says track underscore oh one yeah. with like no <laughs> no you know there's no name on it like can you imagine that going into a music supervisor's database and they mm. all of a sudden they're like oh remember that really great track that had no name and no compose ever happened you know so basically right. anything you put in the universe should be there are you have else have the uh, architecture to hold metadata, whereas waves uh, don't necessarily do that. So mm -hmm. um, there's my long rambling two cents on that. Right, right. Yeah, right. I want to get back to that in, in a second, but I just want to uh, kind of sidetrack here a little bit. Um, the trend of sound editors, the people who pick the music for the TV shows or whatever. Um, it seems to be a trend that they want more and more control, especially with 2018 trends that we've been following. They want more and more control. So how important it is for composers to realize that that trend is happening and that a lot of the tracks that they write um, might only be used as underscores, meaning, like you said, you know, stems being taken out by with melodies and all that stuff. And, you know, do they have to take, should they, take that into account when writing those specific sections. Like if you're writing, um, you know, like drone music and you have a piano playing a melody or something like that, how much focus should they put on the underscoring and, you know, properly positioning like percuss percussive elements, things like that um, to give uh, sound editors options? Well, I mean, a good creative director at a library will be able to listen to a piece of music and anticipate, you know, number one, anticipate what its use is going to be, you know, like, so when we tag audio, we're not only putting in the track name and the artist's name and the, their their IPI so that they can get, you know, they get paid when things air, um, but we also try to uh, tag things with keywords. Um, usage, you know, uh, uh, doing a, uh, an album right now, one of our artists, uh, we do an artist series album where artists will come together and just put, put out a whole album of their own music. Um, and I was tagging stuff that just uh, yesterday and you know he he wrote some this really beautiful orchestral you know dramatic all this m music sort of inspired by world war ii so it's called like brothers in arms or something you know so we're tagging that not only with war and drama and, and orchestral but like you know we need to be able to like you said pull out the piano uh, if, if, if we need to, or, you know, like, cause this string piece might work really, really well without the pipe organ underneath it, you know? So a good, um, creative director will kind of hear, hear a piece, be able to craft alternate versions or alternate mixes based on the material. Cause not, not all alternate mixes are created equal. You know, you might have, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll do a full mix and what we call a less mix, which is just sort of like the same track without some of the really big full elements like if there's you know a couple of synth basses or you know if it's there's if it's orchestra we might do on just strings and piano but um but that said the, the piece of music needs to just work on its own um mm -hmm. and you know it, it has to be it has to sound really good 
You know, it has to it has to work as a piece of music in and of itself, or else the music supervisors aren't going to care at all. Uh, the editors, if they if they hear something and they're like, oh, that sounds like crap, they're not going to listen for more than seven seconds at mm-hmm. something that they think sounds bad before they just move on because there's so much material to choose from. You mm-hmm. know, um, and the idea is to make things easier for them. I mean, because. The, especially with TV and ad stuff, everything happens so quickly. You know, you're right. you're editing, you know, full episodes of TV in you know in a matter of 48 hours. So you know, editors say even less sometimes, 24 hours. Editors mm-hmm. need to be able to be like, what do we need? We need music. How long do we need it? it? Needs to be two minutes. It needs a big, you know, build here. So they need to be able to throw things in. Audition. You know, does this track get in the way of the dialogue? Right. That's what mm-hmm. they're thinking about. So that's what we as creative directors at a library need to think about, but also it's really great if the artist is thinking about that too. Like if you're Mm -hmm. crafting a dramatic tension, sort of undulating synth percussion type track, you want the, you want to think about where that's going to get used Mm -hmm. and how can you make it more accessible to the editors, to the post supervisors, to the music supervisors. And, you know, so that it, a works under dialogue has a couple of big hits and maybe breaks with some verb tail if an editor so most of our tracks are structured into sort of three you know the traditional sort of three uh, act trailer system where you've got you know a simple statement to, to begin a middle sort of statement which is a little bit bigger with the orchestration filled out a bit more and then more of a bigger full statement whether it's your tune or whether it's an ambient you know piano idea or whatever um, and with, with slight sort of little pause, potential pauses that make sense in the music, but also give them those editors a place to snip the track if they need to end it soon. Mm. How important is it to, to have um, sections of a track loopable? Um, you know, not necessarily, you know, we don't, we don't send anything out as loops. Um, you know, it's a good, a uh, music editor or a good audio editor should be able to look at a piece of tr- a piece of music and when i say look i mean i'm serious at like looking with your eyes at a waveform and be like oh we mm. can take from here to here right. and they can they can do that piece you know we're we're not building we're not building toolkits necessarily you know you're we're still crafting musical pieces um, but a, no, like a good a good music editor can can look at a waveform whether they're using Snapper or Audacity or whatever they're doing to audition the music, because they're listening with their ears, but they're looking with their eyes at the waveforms almost a hundred percent of the time, and being like, yes, we'll snip that here right before the big swish, boom, good, and we can loop that part for another minute and a half if we need to. Um, so no, so we we don't worry about that too much, um, and that's not something that an artist, you know, it, that's that's really a, more of a video game thing. Okay. Right. Uh, when you're so, let's let's um, talk about the production here because you say they work with their eyes, they listen with their eyes, which is very interesting. They also see, look at the tracks, the names of the tracks. So I know there are many music libraries out there that require you to name your tracks. So just the mean, you know, meaningful naming of a track that describes in like two, three words or even one word, what the track is, so the music editor can see, oh, we're looking for, you know, uh, a romantic, you know, proposal, you know, right. having that kind of stuff uh, in there. And also, uh, when, you, when you mentioned that they're looking at waveforms, having good quality mastered, mixed and mastered tracks, also yes. really important, and maybe Tim can um, pitch in th- there as well. Yeah, definitely. And I know Mike does a lot of the mix master finalization, but man, to get your foot in the door nowadays with, with the way sample libraries are, it's 2018, man, you got to, you got to sound good. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, to clarify, we expect everybody to send us a final mixed version of their, right. of their track that they approve of. Like this is final, essentially it could go into a catalog as is, you know, or we're not somewhere taking else if I wasn't working raw, with Michael, raw, for example, raw stems or whatever. So, but we, it, I feel, I mean, this is just our, my personal preference. I feel it's really important that a catalog sound like everything belongs together. If you've got 14 different artists and 14 different tracks, um, uh, on a on a on an, on an album, uh, we do album format too, which we can discuss in a second. But 
it makes so much more sense if everything has a similar mastering chain and you know it's all sort of presented at the same level um so that's what we do in our mix is sort of just kind of bring everything in to a similar session with a similar sort of mastering bus um sometimes we'll adjust you know the balance a little bit because we've got decent speakers in here and if there's if we can tell there's just going to be if there's too much competition in the bass or the low mids or whatever we can carve out a little bit of eq every every track gets just a dash of eq a little bit of compression um just so that it all kind of sits better and and that's we go. we don't spend a whole lot of time remixing you know and bringing in live players or anything for that for our mix it's more of just a, a mastering pass uh sort of <laughs> a velvet green sheen if you right, will so that right. everything sounds belongs together um because if you don't do that then you've got you know 14 different you know way you know, levels and you know it just it, it sounds more of like a an amalgam or uh, you know like somebody just slapped it all together so we like it to sound you know plus the track order and you got to figure out you know which track goes first and that type of thing so right it that's should what sound we like the same universe at least so yeah definitely understand yes, from exactly. that point of view I think that one one very important and especially something that helped me personally is having really good reference tracks. Uh, when you're writing yes. and learning how to listen to those tracks, like learn and listen, you know, hear how the instruments, like which, uh, what kind of orchestration it is, which instruments are used, how they're used, what they normally play, um, what they're used for. Are they used for rhythmical passages, for legato passages, for what is their role uh, in the track and how to um how to use that in your own tracks and just you know compare them when you're writing your own track like compare like you said this the 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 horizontal development you know having a b a section or a a one a two section um because that's really important in terms of content but also in terms of production like listen to reference tracks and have set yourself a bar because right. like Tim just mentioned, like the bar is so high at this point to just, you know, it takes a lot to just get your foot in the door and then being consistent and keeping that bar and raising it for yourself is so, so important. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on um, just having reference? Oh, absolutely. Life? You know, I, I mean, <clears throat> so. I don't come from an orchestral background, right? I, I didn't grow up sitting in the violin two section playing Prokofiev, right? So that's that's not part of sort of my pedigree as just as a as a musician. But I can program an orchestra now like nobody's business right. because I practiced at it. You know, when I was a uh, Powell, we take passages from classical music on six films at a time and we would just reprogram with like if a new sample library came out this is even this is pre spitfire uh you know when a new sample library would come out we'd load up all the stuff and we'd take a you know 16 to 32 bars of beethoven or shostakovich you know out of a out of a classical manuscript and we would reprogram it and see how good we could how close we could get it um so uh, you know, that's not, that's not, I'm not just talking about orchestral stuff. If you're into ambient music, you should be listening to Brian Eno. You know, you should be listening to, to folks that are really good, uh, put, putting out music, uh, you know, in the style that you like. If you are really into sort of hard industrial stuff, don't just listen to whatever Junkie's latest score is. Go back and, you know, listen to early Nine Inch Nails, Throbbing Gristle, you know, like some of this, some of the stuff that's really good and really raw, no matter the genre, you know, you like inspirational drama, great, you know, Friday Night Lights, Explosions in the Sky, like you need to get in there and listen and figure out what, what it is that makes those tracks really good. And then, you know, give it a shot for yourself, but always, always A, B. You know, listen to your track, and you don't need to do exact replicas. I'm talking about the mix balance. If it's orchestra right. and it's a big 2D passage, you know, listen to listen to Holst or listen to Mahler, and and think about you know in a in a giant big loud orchestral passage, how much of the brass are you hearing versus the winds and the strings? Mm. You know, when there's a big percussion hit, are you really hearing the violas <laughs> at that point? You know, right. and that's going to help you. With your with your mix balance and that type of thing and that's what really what really really sells so i mean i often give a lot of feedback to our orchestral writers just on the programming it, it is one thing to come up with all the notes and you know to to write you know 
amazing, you know, expressive orchestral fantasy in the style of uh, Danny Elfman, right? But it's another thing to be able to really dig into the programming and, and you know, when you have a giant sort of woodwind run that's being started in the bass clarinets through the bassoons, the clarinets, the, you know, ending up in the piccolo, what is the mix of that, you know, that you're hearing versus the harp and the celeste, you know? Like, there's nothing weirder than all of a sudden hearing something pop out of a mix and sound synthy when you're, you know, when you're really grooving to like an awesome piece of music. So mixing and, and balance and programming, man, it's at, it's at least 50%, you know, I would say it's 60%, yeah. the, the right note and the right music, you know, 35, 40% of, of, you know, it, because, you know, very rarely are we dealing with, you know, going into a hall uh, at, at Velvet Green Music going into a hall and re-recording a string quartet or re-recording, you know, a wind ensemble or anything. We don't do a lot of that because and we expect the artists to be able to, to nail their production. All right. Yeah. And to reference mixes, I would say use reference mixes. Um, I was really averse to using reference mix. Um, the reason is fear because I didn't want to, you know, AB my stuff that I'm producing to, you know, stuff that's <laughs> actually been hit by a mastering engineer. Um, but right. once I started actually getting over that and doing that and referencing the way things sound, um, especially into production music, you know, as we're talking about the production plays such a huge role in it. Um, how do things sound? And, and like Mike was saying, you know, the mix balances and all that stuff, um, just find the best reference tracks you can and, um, utilize those to the best of your ability is my advice there. And don't only listen to film music, right? That's a huge thing. Yeah, you know, there's a film music is such a small percentage of what's out there. You know, broaden your horizons. We all love John Williams, but you know, go, go listen to Holst or you know Shostakovich or Penderecki, Zanakis, whatever floats your boat, man. But like, don't don't just limit yourself to you know whatever new score is is out. And I noticed actually, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work with the type, you know kind of orchestral sample stuff and library work. But when I'm in the car, I'm listening to pop or hip hop. 95% of the time, it's like getting my ears cleaned, you know, because it's just something so different sonically. Um, and I'm able to learn from that. So I've been doing that for I did EDM for about a year. And now I'm doing like rap, hip hop, and it's just it's so different. And, you know, kind of allows you to learn away from DAW, if that makes any sense. I think uh, the importance of importance of spacing, uh, leaving elements, their space to breathe. Don't oversaturate things, um, like Michael mentioned. Um, not just in terms of frequency spectrum, but also in positioning, time-wise. Like you know, um, and this, like you said, you know, pip, pop, hip hop, they have such good, clear mixes. Um, you know, something that is important, you know, a hook, a signature sound is going to cut through, and you have to make that really clear. So you know, but it has to be a good signature sound, and which is the whole other area. You like sound design and having your own original which is not something that is easily taught by listening but more by doing like you know getting into synthesis knowing you know how to do a swoosh you know that it's an envelope with the noise uh, or things like that just knowing how to if you have a sound in your head how to achieve it um so i think that's a whole different section of of production skills and um I think it's really important to be aware of that. Um, and like Michael said, it's not just, you know, knowing orchestral skills and listening to orchestral things, but also, you know, um, Cliff Martinez, uh, guys like that, just, you know, listening to that and hearing, like there is something in there that I don't know what it is. And getting familiar enough with the synthesis and those kind of sound design elements that you, that you get to a level where you, can say what it is oh it's a noise it's a noise it's like it's, it's it's like a percussive noise it's just an envelope it's a very fast one it's not a shaker it's kind of like a shaker but it's not one <laughs> so i think those <laughs> those kind those kinds of um aspects are really important if you want to have some original sounds i think uh, i don't know but michael maybe you can uh, talk about that a, a little bit as well how important is like you having unique elements not just in terms of um compositional skills, but also, you know, sound design skills. Uh, we already talked about produ production skills, uh, but sound design skills and having some, you know, like a library of your own sounds, 
things like that that you sure. can use. No, everybody needs to has to be completely comfortable with their own sort of toolkit, right? Uh, you know, a, a plumber needs to not only know how to use a wrench, but basically any sort of handy tool uh, can come in handy for them. The same thing with, you know, with artists. I mean. I don't expect every artist to be amazing at orchestral programming. I don't expect every artist to really be able to nail um, every genre, which is why uh, you know we've got kind of a sort of a wide uh, a wide breadth at at VGM. I mean, we don't we don't do we don't do everything. We don't do hip hop. We don't do world music. We don't do EDM. We don't do singer songwriters. But we do do drama, action, comedy, and horror, um, and all the various subgroupings, uh, you know, that are there. So, if, as for if an, if a, an artist comes to us and uh, they're interested in instrumental underscore, can usually find a genre that they can excel in. You know, so uh, if you're not a great orchestral programmer. But you know you're really interested in in you know I don't know mystery or something. You know we can usually get some folks going on. Uh, you know like a, we did an X Files sort of inspired uh, brief a, a while back. Um, you know just a, with a little bit more sort of classic synthesizers and you know some some drums maybe string programming. We've got a classic horror sort of. Uh, you know, John Carpenter-ish, uh, you know, place for, for folks to land that are really into that, you know. Um, there's all manner of orchestral sort of genres that, that folks can explore if they're really into that. But, you know, uh, you know, not not every artist is created equal. As long as you are confident in the genre that you're working in, um, I'd say, you know, always put your best foot forward. And, and especially if you're approaching a library, you know, only send them the stuff that you really believe in. Um, uh, and and here's here's a global thing. Never pre-apologize. <laughs> I, I I've more heard you young... talk about this before. Right. I, I, I mean, we got we got a lot of young folks out of Berkeley, you right. know, or you know, who send us some stuff and be like, Sorry. you know, here's here's some of my. Text. It's not my favorite mix, or we couldn't get X Y Z. The minute I hear that, I've already decided that I'm not going to like this music. Right. You know, like it's, you shouldn't be like, oh, this is the best thing that was ever written. I'm going to score How to Train Your Dragon 3 because I'm so much better than John Powell or whatever. You know, that level of confidence is a turnoff as well. But right. you should never be, introduce yourself to someone and be like, hi, my name is, here are the things that you're not going to like about me. Um, <laughs> well, think about a server, makes... you know, in food service dropping off your food. You know, they come to your table and drop yeah. off the food and they apologize for it. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, you're going to go, we've what's, ever cooked, but... what's going on with the food? Uh, I haven't even uh, taken a bite yet. Um, so, yeah, so a lot, and, uh, it, you know, it's just, it, that's, it's just, it's a, a naivety thing because people don't know. Right. But, you know, just, you know, be cool and be like, here's something I really feel, you know, strongly about. That, that says more to me. Uh, you know, than than almost anything else. Right. And your music's gonna sell. Your music's gonna sell itself. So really, I think rarely what you say is gonna make a difference in that. Whether you know, unless you come off as completely arrogant or completely you know in, in denial of your own <laughs> skills. You know, as right, long as right. you're not shooting yourself in the foot and you focus on your production, you focus on your craft. It's it's easy to make good relationships in the business. In my totally. Opinion. Um, it's people, you know, you, you come across as like, like Michael said, pre-apologetic or they just, they tend to be wordy in emails or just, you know, a little too much. Um, so that's probably a good place to move, uh, Michael. Like what else do you like to see and what else do you not like to see um, when it comes to people kind of, because my email came from Craigslist and I can tell you, I know that was a, a, an essay, I'm sure. Um, I've learned a lot since then. But um, I, I can only imagine, you know, the kinds of emails that you still get. And this is people that aren't artists for you yet. Um, so with no right. preconceived notion of, you know, who they are, or what their music's like, can you tell us a little bit about like what your experience is there? Um, you know, OK, I never need to see somebody's resume. Um, essentially, ever we get it. We do get a lot of, you know, attached PDFs. Um, <laughs> So, so which that never get looked at. I, I would say, you know, there's a couple of rules, and you can dig around on the internet, and, and I'm sure in in various forums and find these sort of rules. But um, in general, people like streaming links rather than never attachments. 
right. I, I don't know what who the hell you are or what you're sending me or how it is going to infect my computer. Um, but usually if something comes with an attachment, I'll automatically just get rid of it. Right. Um, so streaming links rather than, you know, uh, rather than e rather than even Dropbox or anything like that, you know, send me a SoundCloud link or a real crafter link. Um, it's really good good when folks take the time to curate a specific playlist um, and not just here's a link to my SoundCloud page that has 900 things on it, some of which are, you know, reposts right. of other people's Figure things. Figure what's going to work you know. for you. Yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, no, like you should be, uh, you should be putting together a package as a presentation, not yes. just a link yes. to here's my social media, follow me on Instagram. Um, because I, I don't have time for that. You know, what, what I want to say is, oh, you took the time to look at uh, and also research the yes. catalog or, or the filmmaker or whatever, whatever you're approaching. If you're looking for to work with or for a company or a person or an individual or whatever, you got to figure out what that per person is looking for. Hip hop and EDM DJs sending us their material. And I was good for about the first year. I would respond to everybody and right. be like, right. like, hey, thanks. Your stuff sounds great. This is, this is um, you know, you. Um, I just don't even have the time to do that now. I just delete them. Right. Um, you know, so if, if somebody com comes to us with, you know, their, <laughs> a lot of their, their new pop album that they just put out, and I'm like, yay, that sounds great. I love this music. I will totally come see you in a bar. However, right. no, I don't you. know what to do with this. This is right. not what my business is. Um, so uh, so know who you're approaching and then put together something specific for whatever opportunity it is. I mean, I, you know, I, I run this company, but I still do, you know, I score, score films and, and TV shows and stuff. And for every gig, I put together a specific curated real crafter reel or something, you know, because, you know, if, if, if it's an Americana, you know, like... Uh, uh, you know, Alaska, the last frontier kind of score that the people are looking for. There's no real need for me to send them all of my horror stuff. Right. You know, uh, which might be good. I might be good at horror. Great. That's not appropriate for that, you know, for that call. So, you know, be succinct, be polite. I like to see as few words as possible, but you know, just cause I don't have the time to read four busy. paragraphs right. about, yeah, about, you know, where you grew up and, you know, who taught you to play, you know, the accordion and what professor you studied under at whatever. I'm sure that all is a big part of who you are. Yeah. But if I'm just, if I'm, if I'm looking at a new artist, I want to see who it is. I want to, I will scroll through. Nobody listens to full tracks too, by the way. Right. You know, I scroll through the seconds. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Skip to the middle. Right. Boom to the end. And that I can immediately say, okay, you this and this, and, you know, 30 seconds or, or nay. Um, so that, I mean, that's my, to, to, right. And I'll, I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent here about, um, Michael's point to kind of crafting a custom spec for a client or a library or anyone you want to work with. Um, it takes five minutes, guys. Like we're all busy composing and, and producing and laying down tracks, you know, figure out what the sample libraries are. We're all super busy. We know that. But it's, it literally takes five minutes to go on the SoundCloud, um, create a new playlist, say to Michael John Molo, you know, include their name. I always do that. So before they even click it, if they notice the URL, their name's in it. So, you know, they know it's customized for them. It's not just the same thing that I send, you know, anyone that wants to hear my music. I've gone through, I've curated a custom playlist and I'll send that off, you know, with, you know, and, and try to waste people's time as little as possible. Cause I know I, I, I value people's time twice as much as I value my own. That's kind of my general rule. So as a result, I tend not to bother people. <laughs> so that's my rant on that. Very true. Um, we have a few questions from Facebook. Um, I think Tim already opened up with one. Uh, but here's another one uh, that's a little different. Um, Ashton Gleckman, he asks, uh, what was your journey like in terms of founding your own production music company? Uh, how did you lay the groundwork and start the process of working with composers? 
<laughs> well, I, I may have mentioned, I, I sort of fell backwards in, into this. Um, you know, I, I had been writing production music for forever since, pro, you know, over, um, and, uh, I, you know, basically when else, another, a show, a team, um, I try to make sure, I mean, I, I, I treat the studio like my work. So I come in and I, I drop my kids at school and I work from nine to five or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's work it, it, and I should be working all the time. Um, so whenever I don't have a project to work on, I'm always just sort of churning out library music, you know, and, and it started with me, uh, just writing for a bunch of different catalogs and whoever needed, usually I had a couple of down days or even a week in between, uh, you know, in between things that were keeping me busy. Um, but I fell backwards into it and I had a, an extended period of time sort of at the beginning or maybe in the middle of 2016 when a film ended and I was supposed to start something else and it got pushed like by two weeks and then it got pushed by another couple of weeks um, and my schedule just worked where I didn't have a part of them in six weeks. This is a great opportunity for me to go into my iTunes, find all my old demos and things, things I've written, right. you know, that, that, that uh, thrown out or uh, maybe I demoed as an additional music composer and didn't get it. So I had, you know, just, I knew that I had a ton of music sitting in my iTunes that I could either repurpose or, you know, repackage and try and get it out into libraries. Cause that's what, I mean, that's the main goal, the passive income right. um, is you know, to, to get your music out there and get those checks, those quarterly checks to roll in and, you know, and help, uh, help you through the, through the year. So, um, so I did that and I found that I had, I had probably like 60 or 70 tracks, man, but not, I mean, that's, that's a drop in the bucket compared to anything, right. but not quite enough of any one thing to really make a difference. I had like to comedy tracks or maybe like four sort of classic horror -y tracks. Um, it just didn't amount to enough to really package as one thing, you know, cause everything was stylistically different. So I went out to a couple of friends and I said, Hey, you guys want to do this too? Maybe we'll put it all together or at least a couple of albums, you know, maybe some of this will get used. Um, so we did that and, you know, ended up with maybe a hundred tracks or 110 tracks. Um, and then I started sort of taking a couple of meetings around town. You know, I, I know a lot of library folks um, having done it for a while and, you know, went out to a lot of lunches, a lot of coffees, like, how do I, how do I do this? How do I, you know, what should the artwork look like? You know, how should I approach, uh, you know, other, you know, library aggregators, that kind of thing. And I got a lot of really great feedback, you know, from, from all sort of, uh, all sort of sectors, at, which made me realize that what we were putting together wasn't going to amount to anything. It wasn't going to be attractive to a supervisor and editor because there just wasn't enough of it. You know, like a hundred tracks next to Warner Chapel that has, you know, five or 600,000 tracks. Right, exactly. It, it just, it, it, you know, there's, there wasn't enough to, to make a difference. So I thought, okay, I've got a couple more weeks left before, you know, the whatever I need to do next. I went out and sent some emails to a couple of the um, music production colleges. Berkeley, uh, you know, basically anywhere that had a production music or, or like a music production sort of uh, degree, whether it's a BA or, you know, an A or whatever. So Full Sail, you know, Berkeley, uh, Frost in Miami. I had connections at USC and UCLA. Um, and I went out to the alumni associations at those places and I said, hey, do you have any, you know, recent graduates that are looking for something to do because we're kind of putting together um and that just sort of opened the floodgates right and and to 2017 we i was able to gather up 40 or so writers put up a website you know uh we, we had 25 you know distinctly sort of branded albums into a couple of different um genres and you know we just started the company and it has just grown exponentially over the last 18 months. Um, and now it's taking up, you know, more of my time than, than, than anything else, just in terms of the admin and right. keeping, you know, keeping 400 artists that want to write writing. Um, <laughs> it's just a lot of emails, you know, like that type of thing. It's a lot of mixing. It's a lot of keeping track of stuff, but I honestly, man, I, I love it. I never intended to do it. Um, but now I wouldn't have it any other way. Here's when I knew that you were great. Well, you've done a lot of great things since we worked together, but one of them was um, out of the blue, you had emailed me, hey, Tim, about, a, I think, two months ago, you expressed interest in writing for this album. You said, well, are you still going to write for it? And I was like, man, he's got 300 composers. How does he remember that? So I was like, yeah, let me get right on that. 
So it's so, yeah. so or organization then that's that's the that's the brilliant thing between you know we've got a custom filemaker database that sends me alerts when you know uh when albums are coming up and people have expressed interest as long as i tag them as, right. as part of this album I, I kind of get get a set of alerts and I've, I've got a million notes documents and google docs and stuff <laughs> that i can usually cross reference and that and just having access to my i never delete any emails so i can always just right. you know type your name into my search in mail and i can see what the last six conversations we had were and be like oh that's right we're back really in buff. april he did right. say he wanted to do this let me check in with him again um and see because if not i can totally get somebody else you know um but it's I'm, I'm able to keep track of right for your planning a lot of folks yeah it's, that's pretty impressive Okay, um, so uh, let's see. I think have... we covered Catalan's question, which is, do you prefer yeah. SoundCloud links or Dropbox? Just, I think I heard somewhere if it's not within three clicks, they're not going to listen to it. Does that sound accurate, Michael? Yeah, generally, I should be able to click click a link and have have it immediate. Uh, you know, you should never have to dig to right. find somebody something. Um, I you know I don't like links to your Bandcamp album. I mean, right. I'm, I'm I'm very happy for you that you were able to do that. You know, um, I, I, congratulations, but no, I, I don't need a band camp, you know, or, you know, a, a link to, you know, 700 tracks, you know, we like five tracks, five, it, it, within five tracks, we can tell, you know, if you're very, if your talents are varied enough, or if you're good right. at one specific thing, right. I don't need more than five tracks to, to figure that out. And like I said, I'm going to listen to eight seconds here, 10 seconds here, you know, six seconds at the end you know how is the mix on that Ooh, this this one says romance in it can she do that as well uh that type of thing um you know that that's what's going through my head when i'm listening to somebody's new music um and be like okay because i can hear in your music i can hear you'd be good for this brief this brief right. and this brief right. that we're currently doing you're thinking about briefs not their music or where they came from or you're thinking yeah, about where so they fit thinking about them. how because we don't release pre-existing music right. we get that question a lot too somebody sends us their soundcloud link or whatever and be like oh you know it sounds great let's work together and they'll be like okay so which which of my tracks do you want I'm like we don't want any of your tracks they all sound great you you those were written for something we have very specific you know requirements right. for every brief right format naming you know blah 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 so you know if you if you want to write something new let's do that and i'm happy to walk you through it Right, and not hey, can I recall this project from three years ago that was on an external drive and try to get stem? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a nightmare. Um, definitely, yeah. and it's guys, it's not that Michael's heartless when he talks about the eight seconds skipping through track. That's everyone that you're gonna approach yeah. ever. So that's yeah. just general yeah. knowledge for you Editors, guys. Supervisors, music executives. Right. You know, I mean, we all like to sit down and listen to music for pleasure. This is this is business. Right. This is you know. Right. I need to. I need to. I need to spend thirty seconds thinking about you, and see if if it's going to work. Because if it's going to work, I'm going to start devoting more of my attention towards you, um, and I need that thirty seconds. So you either need to. It either needs to be a yes, no, right first, and then we can go down the path of all right. How are we going to do this and collaborate? Because I mean, it is it's a, it, it is a collaboration. Right. Right. You know, you're sitting in your room writing. You're writing to a brief that we put together. That's going to, and that track is going to have to sit on an album with 14 other things somewhat like it, right. you know. Um, so it really is, it is a back and forth, um, uh, and expect notes. That's another thing. Yeah, and expect good notes. I love Michael's notes. Anytime they're so positive and just great. I I, I always tell him that. And some notes that I get are not so nice. So yeah, it's uh, always been a pleasure working with Mike there. Um, yeah. So one, one thing I get um, quite a bit, Michael, and I, I get this, I am multiple times a week um, and they, you know, people come out to me and, and they haven't really done a whole lot or they've scored a couple indies or, you know, a couple hundred dollar gigs or so. And they go, oh, you know, how can I get involved in production music? It looks so cool. You know, how, where should I start? You know, um, and that's such a broad question because it's like, well, you, you be good at music, you know be you know like what what advice would you have to someone that asked that broad of a question uh well i mean just so focus on what your strengths are right and and lead, lead with those but like i think and i've said it so you know like if you're really good at you know dark sort of synth palsy stuff good do that really really well and don't go to uh, an orchestral publisher and be like hey you should check out my latest you know like girl with a dragon tattoo cue um, right. because 
that doesn't make any sense for an orchestral fantasy album. Um, so, you know, put your best stuff forward, make sure it's focused, make sure that it's your, your web presence uh, is all sort of branded. It says who you are. Um, you know, there's nothing, nothing really, well, I should say there's nothing worse, but we, we get a lot of links that, you know, SoundCloud things that don't have like artwork. You know, it doesn't take a lot to find a little image or something and it just shows you put it up there. Uh, did not too long bio is great, right? I, I don't, I, like I said, I don't need to read who you studied under at Kalamazoo State University, but you know, uh, this, this is who I am, this is that I, that I write, this is what inspires me, you know, two two paragraphs three paragraphs that should be prominent on your website you know? um and you know it's it's one thing to have questions i love when our artists have questions for me because i'm always happy to answer them but your initial reach out email shouldn't be listen to my music here's the thing about you right right and, and Introduction to, to an introduction to your, of, of yourself. You know, just be like, "Hey, I've heard X, Y, and Z. I know a friend of mine writes for you, or whatever. You know, um, and here's my music. I think I would be a good fit." That is a perfect email with a SoundCloud link, um, right. and I'm more likely to be, like, "Yes, that person isn't going to take up 45 minutes of my time right now." You know, in in our first initial email. Right. Let's face it, everyone with the bios and the act. I mean, you're not John Williams. You're probably not John Powell, you know, just unless you really have to list this stuff, just kind of shy away from doing that because people kind of look at the whole award winning composer, blah, blah, blah. Like it. You know what I mean? It's just chill on that. <laughs> right, Be more right. about presenting your music. Um, and, you know, if I'm reaching out to Mike, I want to figure out what need he has that I can fulfill and not so much my own. So that's kind of another mantra that yeah. I try to live by. It's a very Absolutely. That's industry. very smart. Yeah. All right, we got a couple minutes left. If you guys, um, yeah, I mean, we had a couple little things like getting familiar with the lingo. So, you know, we talked a little bit about stemming and stuff like that. Um, again, guys, this is something you should definitely have done or do for yourself. You know, practice stemming out your tracks. Um, if you are lucky enough to work with someone like Michael and get a brief, you know, practice actually stemming the stuff out and re-importing it. Make sure, you know, make sure it's a delivery that you'll be proud of. That's my biggest thing. Cause I don't, you know, I see a lot of people that work in the industry and they do this every day and I get deliveries that are sloppy and it, you know, it costs a lot more time for everyone. So that's, that's my parting piece as a so, you know, producer. Um, so before we wrap up, Michael, um, do you have any other general tips for producers, composers that want to get into production music? Um, sure. You know, you should be, uh, you need to be out and about and meeting folks. You don't necessarily need to live in Los Angeles to do it. It's, you know, we have artists on six continents, um, but it certainly helps um, to be in, in and around a major city, um, both for just for, for different events, you know, LA, New York, there are amazing organizations that you can be part of. The, the Production Music Association is amazing. Uh, I highly recommend folks join as, uh, as composers. Um, the Society of Composers and Lyricists are great. They have, um, you know, events in Los Angeles and New York. Um, the Guild of Music Supervisors, listen, those are the folks that are, are hearing your music and, get, and really getting it into film, TV, uh, you know, Netflix, even games. Um, so, you know, supporting your, your support your local music uh, supervisor. It's uh, it's it's well worth the, the effort. Um, but you know, join join their guild. There's a great um, award ceremony that they do uh, once a year in downtown LA. You know, if you're if you're in the area, you should come. You should go to that. You know, it's 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 great fun. Um, you know, it's great to sort of meet new folks and just be just be chill, be cool, be honest. You know, in your introductions to new to new people, you know about who you are, what your skill levels are. D you know, don't tell somebody that you know you are the next John Williams when you're really the next Trent Reznor, um, because you know you your your initial uh, you know meeting with somebody is going to set up their expectations. Right. You know, it's so true about first impressions. You really don't get a chance to make them, um, you, know, you know, more than once. Um, and then also, you know, don't approach a music library 
saying that you want to write a bunch of music and then go through the process of, you know, filling out their forms and, you know, receiving their briefs. And then five days later, be like, peace, I'm on a gig now. <laughs> Honestly, oh, we, man, get, that, we get that a lot, you know, so like, you know, folks will, will you know, send us their link, we'll listen through, be like, great, we can use you here, here, here and here. Um, we don't do quotas, we don't do any of that. But if somebody says, hey, I would really like to write a piece for this brief or such and such a brief, then you know, c commit to that, um, right. and then when and then when you're done with that, be like, okay, cool, that was awesome. I'm gonna circle back with you in a couple of weeks because I've got other stuff. We have folks that come and go all the time. It helps that we have so many, so that our briefs can always we can always have somebody you know working on a zombie brief if you know so and so um, you know gets a gets a film or we've got a lot of guys um, and gals who uh who will go off on tour with their bands you know for four months at a time and then they'll come back off the road and have like six weeks and bang out a couple of tracks and then go off on the road again um i i feel like for us that's awesome i love being able to give folks an opportunity to write um you know in between their other commitments that's really big for me but don't commit to doing something and then uh, not deliver. That's always a big thing. Right. Cause that could set Michael back on a release, which is, you know, a lot of other things, there's art, there's a lot of other moving parts there. So, you know, the last thing that I think that he wants to be waiting on is a track from something you said you'd commit to three months ago. So, <laughs> right. Exactly. All right. So okay. I think that pretty much does it for me. Um, be a good hang guys. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. That's the thank, big thing. thank you so much for uh, finding the time to join us today, Michael. Of course. Hey, let me let me end with this. Um, we, Velvet Green Music, need and want more female artists. Um, I'm not saying that we we don't want male artists. Love. But we, you look at our roster, and it is 95% white dudes with glasses or beards. We want more. Um, talent, there are talented female composers uh, and artists. We want you. Uh, we want more composers of color. Um, it's really super important to us. It's part of our business model that we are all inclusive. It doesn't matter where you are or who you are. Um, but it, it is a shame that earlier this week we welcomed 57 new artists since the beginning of 2017 or 2018 rather. And of those 57, only four of them were female. That is a failure on my part as a creative director for not actively scouting and seeking out more um, female talent, more talent from composers and artists of color. Um, come to us. Um, and if anybody has suggestions for me on how to better diversify our roster, it's very, very important. Right, guys and, and ladies, of course. Um, consider that a semi call to action. I mean, we have GCN, we have a very diverse crowd here. Um, we'll probably open up another thread at some point to have a Q and a, um, perhaps with Michael soon, see, you know, what his needs are. And if any, um, the last thing I'm sure he wants is 2000 emails from everyone, but, um, <laughs> let's, let's cross that bridge when we come to it and, you know, take, take note of what Michael said. And we're going to go ahead and address that in a separate thread at some point here within the next probably week or so. Um, you'll see Great. our moderator, Rachel, take point on that. Um, and I think that's it from me, guys. Do you have anything else? Uh, I'm good. Everybody be cool. All right, cool. Thank you yeah. so much for taking the time, Mike. Absolutely. Happy to help. Take care. All right. So thank you again, Michael, for joining us today. Uh, and if you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, join the Global Composers Network group on Facebook, and visit our website, globalcomposersnetwork.net. Thank you and see you again soon.